So I'm Adam Hunt. I work with the uh, uh, Section for Evolutionary Psychiatry at the World Psychiatric Association, and this is our webinar series. Today, we're very lucky to have uh, Laith al Shawath with us. Um, Laith is a, an associate professor in the Department of Psychology and affiliated faculty at the Center for Cognitive Archaeology at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Um, Dr. Al Shawaf has published dozens of scholarly papers in peer reviewed journals, and his uh, popular science essays have been translated into several languages and are excellent. I can really highly recommend um, checking out uh, Laith's, Laith's stuff. So, his empirical research is mostly focused on emotions, uh, with additional emphasis on cognition, personality, and in individual differences. The Association for Psychological Science has named him a rising star. Uh, so we're very lucky to have him here with us today, and he's been selected as a visiting fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin, as well as the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse. Uh, Leith has also won awards for both research and teaching, and is the primary editor of the Oxford Handbook of Evolution and the Emotions, coming out in early 2024, which sounds like it's going to be um, a real tour de force in talking about uh, the evolution of emotions, and that's exactly what he's here to talk to us today about. So thank you so much, Leith, for, for joining us. Um, you can share your screen and get started. Great. Thanks a lot, Adam, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for having me here today. It is a pleasure to be here. Can you see my screen? Great. Okay. So um, thanks again for having me. My name is Leith. As Adam said, I'm a psychologist, and uh, I've been asked today to talk to you about a contemporary evolutionary approach to the emotions. Here's a little outline for today's talk. I'll introduce this contemporary evolutionary approach, which is known as the coordinating mechanisms approach, and I'll illustrate it with a few examples. And then we'll talk about some of the implications and insights that emanate from this approach. We'll talk about what it has to offer us uh, in for our understanding of the mind. I'll talk a little bit about how this approach differs from other approaches, especially other older evolutionary approaches to the emotions that uh, will probably be familiar to audience members. And then we'll end by asking whether or not this approach is useful, whether it op offers any practical tidbits that might be of use in the clinic or in our personal lives or in our personal relationships. So the approach that I'd like to talk to you about today is called the coordinating mechanisms approach. It suggests that emotions are coordinating mechanisms, which means that emotions coordinate or regulate or orchestrate the activity of a variety of different psychological and physiological mechanisms, a variety of different systems in the body and mind, and that emotions orchestrate these different systems together in service of solving an adaptive problem. Now, that's kind of abstract uh, right now, but I'll illustrate it with examples to make it more concrete in a moment. What I would like us to keep in mind, though, as I move forward and offer the examples, is the key notion that emotions are not just feelings. They are not just feeling states or the subjective phenomenology of what it feels like to be in, in the grip of an emotion. Instead, emotions initiate a whole cascade of changes in the body and mind. Emotions affect attention and perception and what we remember and what we are capable of encoding in memory. They affect our motivational priorities. They affect our physiology and our behavior. And they even have subtle but important effects on things like how we conceptually carve up the world. So as we move forward, let's uh, keep this key notion in mind. Emotions are much more than just feeling states. They are regulatory mechanisms or coordinating mechanisms that affect many different aspects of our cognition, physiology, and behavior in service of solving a key problem. In the case of fear, imagine, let's say, that a predator is rushing at you you're likely to feel afraid, but you don't just feel afraid. Uh, there's a whole host of changes that take place in your body and mind. Your attention narrows to the dangerous stimulus. Your perception is heightened and focused. Other motivational goals are downregulated. For example, you don't care quite as much now about finding valuable nutrition or uh, a compatible mate because those are not pressing problems, so they can be paused or postponed for later. If you already know 
the layout of the terrain, then your memory for escape routes is heightened and those escape routes become more cognitively accessible to you. Physiologically, non-pressing issues like digestion and immune function and cellular repair are also suppressed or paused because they're not pressing issues right now. And energy is shunted where it's needed, which in this case is toward your muscles for escape. And what I'd like us to take away from this is that even though in everyday parlance, colloquially, when we talk about fear, we're often talking about and thinking about the feeling state of being afraid, fear is actually much more than just the subjective phenomenology or the feeling state of being afraid. As we can see, uh, fear consists of a whole host of changes to attention and perception and motivation and physiology and behavior. And... Um, the approach that I'm suggesting uh, we should adopt today, the coordinating mechanisms approach, suggests that fear coordinates these changes in cognition and physiology and behavior in service of solving an adaptive problem. In the case of fear, that adaptive problem is avoiding a dangerous predator or a hostile conspecific. In the case of disgust, the adaptive problem would be avoiding a pathogenic infection. So. When we look at disgust, we find something similar, which is that disgust results in a whole host of physiological and psychological changes in the body and mind. When you uh, experimentally trigger disgust in participants, that reduces their willingness to engage in pathogenic behaviors. Disgust activates the immune system, including the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and an increase in basal temperature, which is part of the immune response. Disgust inhibits sexual arousal and reduces sexual risk-taking, meaning it makes it more difficult to achieve sexual arousal and it makes participants less interested in taking sexual risks. Disgust reduces interest in short-term mating, meaning interest in casual sex or having a variety of partners. It affects our physiology, changing our skin conductance and heart rate. And behaviorally, if you bring participants into the lab and you trigger their disgust by presenting them with a pathogenic stimulus, it will li literally trigger avoidant motor behavior. You'll see participants withdrawing, trying to avoid or get farther from the offending stimulus. And so again, what we're looking at here is these changes are, they form a functionally coordinated set. They are all organized and geared toward reducing the likelihood of pathogenic infection. So disgust is not just what it feels like to be disgusted. It is a cascade of changes in the body and mind that seem to functionally cohere in solving this problem. Studies even show that disgust reduces or changes participants' self-reported personality, how participants feel about their own personalities. So if you trigger disgust or you... Um, convince participants that there is a pathogen threat, an imminent pathogen threat, participants will report feeling less extroverted and feeling less open to experience, which also makes sense because if there's an imminent pathogen threat, then this is not a good time to be gregarious and affiliating with others and touching others, nor is it a good time to be trying new foods, trying new things, trying new cuisines. So Disgust initiates a cascade of changes that seem to functionally cohere in solving the problem of reducing the likelihood of infection. But one way of thinking about this is what I've already suggested, which is emotions are coordinating mechanisms that regulate all of these changes in the body and mind. Another way of thinking about it is that emotions are modes of operation for the body and mind, meaning that when you're in the grip of an emotion, your entire physiology, psychology, and behavior enter into a different mode than when you're in uh, another emotional state. Okay, one more example, just to drive the point home and to illustrate that this doesn't just apply to survival-oriented emotions like fear and disgust, but it also applies to more complex, more social emotions like shame. The apparent evolved, evolved function of shame is to avoid social devaluation and if social devaluation, meaning status loss or reputation loss, if that has occurred to mitigate it, the damages and to try to repair the situation. So what shame does is it motivates us to avoid behavior that might lead to social devaluation, that might lead to reputational loss, and also to conceal information about ourselves that could lead to social devaluation. Studies show that 
if for some reason uh, you do a bad thing and that bad thing becomes known, it spreads throughout the group and social devaluation does indeed occur, then shame causes the individual to withdraw, to accept subordination from other people in the social group, to become more cooperative, and to try to appease or placate others in the social group. And again, as you can see, these changes, um, these psychological changes that are being motivated by shame, again, functionally cohere, and they're oriented toward minimizing the likelihood of social devaluation, or if it has already occurred, mitigating the damages and trying to repair the situation. Studies also suggest that many shame triggers are cross-culturally universal, even comparing between industrialized nations and forager societies and hunter-gatherer societies, with correlations between countries on the order of about positive 0.7 or positive 0.72, so pretty strong positive correlations between cultures. And in a very clever set of studies, researcher Tess Robertson and colleagues found that to trigger shame, social devaluation is enough. You don't actually have to have done anything wrong. So what the researchers did was they crafted a set of experiments in which they teased apart whether or not the participant actually did anything wrong with whether or not the audience thought that the participant did anything wrong. And what they found was, even when the participant was innocent and knew that they were innocent, as long as others thought they had done something wrong, they still felt shame. And so what we're seeing again here with shame is that uh, the emotion is not just how it feels to feel ashamed, but rather it is a whole host of changes in psychology and motivation and behavior that are coordinated toward solving a problem. In this case, the problem is avoiding social devaluation, reputational loss, and status loss. So that is a brief introduction to the coordinating mechanisms approach to the emotions. And the key idea, again, is that emotions are not just feeling states, they are regulatory mechanisms or coordinating mechanisms that orchestrate a whole host of changes in the body and mind towards solving a problem. Now let's talk a little bit about what kinds of implications and insights this approach might offer. The first implication is that emotions are adaptive and they serve evolved functions, and that this is true of even negative or aversive emotions. This might be somewhat obvious to this particular audience, but I think in psychology and in the general public, there's a tendency to think that negative emotions are bad and that they should be stamped out or tamped down. But in reality, negative or aversive emotions are just as functional and just as evolved as their feel-good counterparts. And there's an analogy here with pain, which is that pain feels bad, but it serves a function, which is it signals to the organism that tissue damage is occurring and that it helps motivate the organism to escape the scenario that's causing the damage and to avoid it again in the future. So even though pain feels bad, Pain per se is not the problem itself. It is an indication of an objective external problem that needs to be solved. And I think much the same is true for the negative emotions. Fear feels bad, but it helps protect us from danger. Disgust feels aversive, but it protects us from pathogenic infection. Jealousy feels bad, but it protects our valued relationships from mate poachers or infidelity. Guilt feels aversive, but it helps us repair a social relationship when we have failed to place enough value on another person's welfare, somebody that we're close with. And so the first implication from this approach is that emotions are adaptive and serve evolved functions. And this is uh, just as true, just as true of the negative and aversive emotions as it is of the positive emotions. The second implication is that it is misleading and unhelpful to dichotomize emotions and cognition and place them in conflict with one another as if cognition were rational and emotions were irrational. And this is this kind of dichotomization, cognition versus emotion, cold versus hot, rational versus irrational, has a long history in psychology and in philosophy, but it's not a very good way of thinking about things. Emotions are guides to adaptive action and even when they appear to be characterized by a kind of surface level irrationality, 
they are underlain by a deeper adaptive logic. You might think of them as adaptively rational. Emotions are needed, necessary for survival and reproduction. We couldn't do the basic tasks of life without them. They help us to avoid danger and avoid infection and pair bond and raise children. And so it wouldn't be possible to solve the basic tasks of survival and reproduction without emotions. And emotions are also necessary not just for the big problems of, of life, of survival and reproduction, but they're also necessary to help us solve the more quotidian or mundane problems that we encounter in everyday life. And so there's some well-known work on this by neuroscientist Antonio Damasio. He and his colleagues um, have put forth the somatic marker hypothesis, which shows that when patients have brain damage, to areas in the brain that are relevant to, to emotions, such as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, they have trouble making even very trivial decisions like where to dine in the evening or which seat to take in an auditorium or in a classroom. And the reason for this is that there's rarely a very obvious objective reason to choose one seat over another or one restaurant over another. And as a consequence, we use a, we have a slight emotional preference for one over the other, and that helps us make the decision. And so emotions are guides to adaptive action needed for the big problems of life in survival and reproduction, and even needed for the trivial mundane problems that we encounter every day. Okay, so, so far I've been suggesting that emotions are functional and adaptive and useful. I don't mean for us to take away the conclusion that emotions can never go awry or can never be maladaptive or that they're always helpful. I think that despite what I've said so far, emotions can be maladaptive, can be harmful, they can go awry. And here are some ways in which that can happen. Emotions can be overexpressed or underexpressed. They can be expressed at the wrong time or elicited by the wrong stimuli or triggered by the wrong context. They can exist or be expressed in an unhealthy or maladaptive ratio to one another. And so even though I'm stressing how functional and adaptive and useful emotions are and how they're key to solving problems, big problems and small problems, this is not equivalent to the facile conclusion that we should always trust our emotions. And I don't think that is the sort of blanket conclusion that we want to take away from this. I think there's a more nuanced conclusion that we want to take away. And I will return to this point in the final section of the talk on practical insights and practical uses. The fourth key implication of this approach is one that we already mentioned, that an emotion is not just a feeling state. It's much more than that. Emotions affect dozens of different systems in psychology, physiology, and behavior. Again, memory, perception, attention, conceptual categorization, motivational priorities. And so it is a mistake to identify the overall emotion with just the feeling state or the subjective phenomenology of that emotion. It would be better to identify the emotion with the whole profile of psychological, physiological, and behavioral changes, not just reducing it to the felt experience. There's a really nice example of this from psychiatrist uh, Randy Nessie's excellent book, um, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings. And in that book, Nessie talks about seeing a patient who he later realized had depression, but initially he missed the diagnosis of depression because the patient had a lot of the key symptoms, such as problems with fatigue, problems with appetite, problems with motivation and initiative, but didn't report feeling sad or feeling hopeless. And so Nessie offers this as an example of how you can have the diagnosis or have the disorder without having the felt experience. And I really like this example because I think both in emotional disorders and in just emotions, we have this tendency to overly identify the emotion with the feeling state, thinking that it's the most important part or the defining part, or maybe even the only part. But in reality, I think focusing specifically and exclusively on the feeling state is, is a cognitive bias. It's a very human bias that we fall prey to. And the reason we fall prey to this bias is that 
the subjective phenomenology, the feeling state of the emotion is the thing that is most cognitively accessible to us. It's the thing that is most salient and most consciously accessible. So we, we notice it the most. We have more conscious access to the feeling of an emotion than, say, to the subtle changes that it's having on our physiology or our memory. And in addition to it being the most cognitively salient or accessible element of the emotion, it's also the most obviously valenced element of the emotion. By definition, it, it feels good or feels bad. And of course, we care how it feels. And so this combination of it being obviously valenced and we care about how it feels, combined with it being the most cognitively salient or consciously accessible element of the emotion, leads us to place undue emphasis on the feeling state. But uh, really, this is an unhelpful uh, thing that we do. And instead of reducing emotions to their subjective phenomenology or the way they feel, we should try to remember that emotions consist of more than a dozen changes in our psychology, physiology, and behavior. Okay, the fifth uh, implication emanating from this approach is that emotions quite literally affect what we see in the world, what we notice and what we remember. They, they affect how our perception and attention and memory works. And I think that this has the potential to give us a deeper understanding of conflicts between people because when people are in the grip of, of a different emotion than we are, they will see different things, notice different things, and remember different things. And as a consequence, when we conflict with them, it might be possible to use this awareness to be a little bit more understanding and a little bit more tolerant of our conflicts with our loved ones. I'll come back to this point later at the end of the talk, again, during the uh, practical insights or practical uses. Okay, so here's where we are so far. We talked about this contemporary evolutionary approach called the coordinating mechanisms approach to the emotions, and we illustrated it with a few examples. We talked about the key implications and insights that this approach has to offer. And now I'd like to spend a bit of time comparing and contrasting this approach with the best known other evolutionary approach to the emotions, which is an older approach called the basic emotions approach, which many audience familiars, uh, audience members might be familiar with. And then at the end, we'll talk about again, whether or not this is practically useful. Okay, so uh, again, I'm going to mainly talk about the similarities and differences between the coordinating mechanisms approach and the basic emotions approach. The reason I've picked this one is that it is by far the most well-known evolutionary approach to the emotions. It's an older one. And um, so I'd like to illustrate what I think are some of the theoretical and empirical advantages of the coordinating mechanisms approach over this older evolutionary approach. And just in case there are <clears throat> audience members who are not familiar with the basic emotions approach, this is something that is most closely associated with Paul Ekman and colleagues. In the 70s, he and his colleagues made these big findings that certain emotions appeared to be cross-culturally universal, and they appeared to have uh, facial expressions that were also cross-culturally universal, and these facial expressions appeared to be universally recognizable as well, meaning that, for example, if you take a picture of somebody in Brazil looking afraid and you show it to somebody in Romania, they know exactly what they're looking at. Take a picture of somebody in Romania looking disgusted, you show it to somebody in South Africa, they know exactly what they're looking at. And so uh, these findings were very important. This approach was, um, was quite influential, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the advantages of the current approach over the basic emotions approach. Before doing that, I think it's good to sketch out the common ground, and there is common ground between these two approaches. I think, in fact, that any evolutionary approach to the emotions would suggest um, the following features. And so here are some areas of common ground. Both approaches agree that emotions are guides to adaptive action, that emotions are necessary for survival, that many emotions are cross-culturally universal, that emotions exist in non-human species because they evolve via the normal, gradual, incremental process of evolution by natural selection, and that, as we said earlier, the negative or aversive emotions are just as adaptive as the positive or feel-good emotions. <clears throat> 
beyond this area of common ground, there are some key differences. And I'd like to talk about what those differences are and, and why I think the coordinating mechanisms approach offers certain theoretical and, and empirical advantages over the basic emotions approach. The first key difference is that the basic emotions approach suggests that there is a distinction between emotions that are basic or fundamental and those that are non-basic. And typically, historically, the basic emotions approach has suggested that there are six or more recently seven basic emotions, disgust, fear, anger, joy, sadness, surprise, and sometimes contempt is added to that list, whereas all other emotions are non-basic, pride, shame, love, jealousy, guilt, and so on and so forth. The problem from a contemporary evolutionary understanding of evolutionary theory is that there's no real non-arbitrary theoretically principled reason for drawing this distinction. The distinction is basically arbitrary. And the criteria that are put forth by the basic emotions approach to supposedly delineate and divide the basic fundamental emotions from the non-fundamental emotions are themselves also arbitrary and not very well theoretically grounded. The most famous one, which you may have heard of before, is facial expressions. According to the basic emotions approach, in order to count as a basic or fundamental or evolved emotion, uh, an emotion needs to have a facial expression. The facial expression needs to be universal, and it needs to be universally recognizable. But there's really no reason to insist on this, even though it was uh, very important that, that they found that there were a number of emotions that had universal facial expressions. There's no need to go further and insist that emotions must have universal facial expressions in order to count as basic or evolved. From a more contemporary understanding of evolutionary theory, um, this is sort of irrelevant. Emotions might have a universal facial expression or they might not have a facial expression at all. Whether or not an emotion comes with an accompanying facial expression is going to depend on the net costs and benefits of signaling that emotion to others. If it's beneficial to signal it, you might expect the emotion to have a facial expression. If it's not beneficial or actively harmful, you might not expect the emotion to have a facial expression. For example, envy is often thought of as a covert emotion in which you covertly work to sabotage your rival rivals or outcompete them. And if it's covert, there would be no utility. It might be actively harmful to broadcasting your envy to other people in the social group. Or to take another example, regret is sometimes thought of as an emotion that helps me make better decisions in the future. If I've made a poor decision or an injudicious decision, regret helps me recalibrate so that I can make a better decision in the future. Now, if that's correct, that's a very internal recalibration that's happening within me. It's intrapersonal. So there's no particular reason to expect it to have a universal facial expression. So from a more contemporary understanding of evolution and of emotions, I would suggest that emotions might have universal facial expressions. They might have no facial expression whatsoever, or they might have a facial expression that is context sensitive and only elicited under circum certain circumstances. Okay, a third key distinction between these two approaches is that the basic emotions approach heavily em emphasized survival, claiming that to count as a basic or evolved emotion, the, the emotion must tackle a problem of survival. But from a more contemporary understanding of evolutionary theory, survival is not really the bottom line of evolution. Differential reproductive success is the bottom line of evolution. And when the two conflict, it is usually reproduction that trumps survival. And we can see this in the logic of evolutionary theory, and we can also see it in a whole host of examples. So the coordinating mechanisms approach would instead suggest that emotions don't need to tackle survival. They can uh, tackle other adaptive problems. For example, think about jealousy or romantic love or parental love. These are important emotions, cross-cultural they solve key problems involved in pair bonding and reproduction, but they're not survival per se. They're problems pertaining to mating and reproduction and child rearing. 
And so a more contemporary approach, such as the coordinating mechanisms one, would suggest that the emphasis on survival is misplaced and that emotions can have evolved to solve problems of survival or problems of reproduction or problems that are tributary to reproduction, such as status hierarchy navigation or maintaining solid friendships. And so there's no reason to keep emotions like guilt, jealousy, parental love, shame, or pride out of the quote unquote basic or evolved emotions. Emotions can contribute to any adaptive problem tributary to reproduction, not just survival. A fourth key distinction is there's a strange stipulation made by the basic emotions approach, which is that in order for an emotion to count as basic and to count as distinct from other emotions, it must have a distinctive physiology, meaning a distinct pattern of heart rate activation, blood pressure activation, cortisol release, and so on and so forth. But this is kind of a strange stipulation. It needlessly singles out physiology and places undue emphasis on it. Again, if we remember that emotions activate and orchestrate more than a dozen changes in physiology and behavior and memory and motivation and attention and perception, there's no real reason to single out physiology and insist that that is the defining thing that helps us delineate different emotions and figure out which ones are basic. A more contemporary approach would argue that different emotions are distinct if they evolve to solve distinct adaptive problems. For example, fear and disgust are not distinct because they have a different pattern of heart rate and blood pressure and skin conductance. They're distinct because they evolved to solve different problems. Fear tackles problems of hostile conspecifics and imminent dangers, falling off cliffs, stuff like that. And disgust tackles problems of infection and pathogen avoidance. That's why they're distinct emotions, not because they have a different pattern of skin conductance and cortisol spikes. Or if you want to be more proximate about it rather than ultimate, if you want to be more proximate, you might say disgust and fear are different because they have different overall profiles of cognitive and physiological and behavioral activation. Again, no particular need to single out in this kind of arbitrary way physiology as being the defining feature. And then finally, there's another sort of somewhat strange stipulation that the basic uh, emotions approach makes, which is that in order for an, an emotion to count as basic or evolved, you must be able to find it in non-human primates. And this sounds like a really strange idea. I think that it is essentially based on, I think it's a vestige or a holdover of the old false biology versus culture dichotomy. Now, to an audience like this, I, I hardly need to say that the biology versus culture dichotomy is misguided and unhelpful and inaccurate. But imagine for a moment that you buy into the, the dichotomy. If you do buy into it, then what you might say to yourself is, okay, humans I know have culture, but no other species has culture. They only have biology. Therefore, if I look at these other species and I find the emotion in them, I can be assured that it's biological, not cultural. And therefore, when I study that emotion in humans, I can also be assured that it's biological. And again, I think that's a very unhelpful way of thinking about it. But this insistence that in order for an emotion to count as basic or evolved, you have to find it in non-human primates, I think is predicated on this false dichotomy, the bi biology versus culture of one. And I also think it is predicated on a bit of human exceptionalism, which it sneaks in through the back door with the notion that humans have culture and other species don't, humans are better than other species, maybe a bit of scala nature way of thinking where humans are above or better others than other species. So um, a more contemporary approach would suggest that the existence in other primates of that emotion is frankly utterly irrelevant. Um, this is predicated, I would suggest, on the false dichotomy of biology versus culture along with a bit of human exceptionalism. And really adaptations, including emotions, can be shared with other species or they can be unique to humans, or they could be shared with other species with features that are unique to humans. It's really theoretically arbitrary to insist on the existence in other primates. Okay.
And then finally, coming to um, the last part of our talk, let's ask whether or not this is useful. Um, of what use is this perspective? This uh, reminds me of an anecdote. The anecdote is usually attributed to Benjamin Franklin, sometimes attributed to Michael Faraday. And according to the anecdote, um, there was a public demonstration of an invention occurring. And at the end of the demonstration, somebody came up to Benjamin Franklin and said, well, yes, it's all very well and good. It's all very interesting. But of what use is it? And he's reputed to have responded, well, madam, of what use is a newborn baby? And I always kind of like that response. It's a funny quip. Um, to me, it suggests two things. The first thing is that there might be certain things that are inherently valuable for their own sake, like deeper knowledge of the human mind, a better understanding of ourselves. And presumably the second point he was trying to make is that we don't necessarily know yet. It might not have immediate practical applications, but it might have very useful practical applications in 10 or 15 years. And so in my opinion, it is misguided to judge a new scientific innovation or development on the basis of whether it yields practical immediate benefits. But I, I think that some people are going to ask this question and it is a reasonable question to ask. So, so let's try to tackle it. And I think tackling it begins by admitting that there is a paradox here. The paradox is that I've been talking about how good and useful and adaptive and functional emotions are. They evolved for a reason. They serve a function. They're necessary for survival and reproduction. They're even needed to solve trivial problems in everyday life. But at the same time, it's obvious that emotions sometimes lead people astray, that um, emotions are involved in psychological disorders, that there is such a thing as emotional disorders, and that in one way or another, people often suffer because of their emotions. And so how can we reconcile these two obviously true things? On the one hand, emotions are functional, useful, and adaptive. On the other hand, they're sometimes involved in psychopathology. People suffer become of, because of them. They can lead people astray. And I'm going to try to address this paradox, but I've added here a little picture of the uh, famous Turkish chef Salt Bey. He's sprinkling salt on this portion of the presentation to remind us that this is going to be a bit more speculative than the other sections, a bit more forward-looking. And so we might want to take these ideas with a bit more of a grain of salt. But let's try to address the paradox. I think that what we need to do is avoid dichotomizing emotions as a blanket good or a blanket bad, and instead adopt a more nuanced approach that admits certain key distinctions. These key distinctions, I think, will help us understand how emotions can be adaptive and functional and useful, and yet sometimes go awry or cause suffering or lead us astray. The first key distinction is emotions as a guide to adaptive behavior versus emotions as a guide to the truth. As we know, Adaptations don't evolve because they're maximally accurate or maximally veridical. They evolve because they contribute better to reproductive success on average than other variants available in the population at the time. And so, yes, emotions are going to be useful on average guides to adaptive behavior, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are a royal road to the truth or offer a privileged window onto the truth. Another useful distinction to bear in mind is emotions as ancestrally adaptive versus currently adaptive. Many audience members will be familiar with the notion of evolutionary mismatch. We have plenty of emotions or plenty of adaptations that evolve for a reason that are functional and that would have been very helpful during the period of human evolution. But we now live in an environment that's quite socially and ecologically different than the ones we evolved in. And as a consequence, those adaptations can lead us astray now. And the canonical example for that would be preferences for salt and sugar and fat and calories, calorically dense food, which was helpful during our evolution. But now with the hyperabundance of hyperprocessed foods often leads us into trouble, gets us into trouble. And so bearing in mind evolutionary mismatch and this distinction may be useful. Another distinction I think is worth keeping in mind is that the on average expression of an emotion can be adaptive without every single instance of its expression or manifestation being adaptive. Again, as we said, 
adaptations evolve because they work quite well on average most of the time and better than the other available variants in the population at the time of their evolution. That doesn't mean they're going to be perfect in an exceptionless way and every time that they're activated they're going to be helpful. Um, as, as you know, natural selection is a best thought of as a satisficing algorithm or ameliorizing algorithm, not a true optimizing one. And um, just as is true with bones and noses and uh, and muscles is also true with emotions. They are useful and evolved for a reason, but that doesn't mean they're never going to make mistakes or that every single instance of their activation will be adaptive. And then finally, one last useful key distinction is that the capacity for emotion can be adaptive, even if the contexts of its elicitation or the degree of activation are maladaptive. And I think that these distinctions, what they push us toward is an, an, an acknowledgement that there's no need to blanket vilify emotions, thinking of them as the irrational counterpart to human cognition, which is rational. But there's also no need, and it wouldn't be helpful, to blanket trust your emotions in a kind of self-help your emotions always have ancestral wisdom embedded in them kind of way. And so instead of the blanket vilification or the blanket trusting, uh, keeping in mind these key distinctions is a better way to go. And it, these key distinctions, I think, help us understand when and how emotions can be adaptive and functional on the one hand, and yet lead us astray or make mistakes on the other hand, how those things can be simultaneously true. Another way of summarizing this might be to say that emotions are a guide to adaptive action ancestrally and on average, but that and that they help us advocate for our needs and our self-interest. They help us advocate for our fitness interests, but this doesn't necessarily mean they offer a royal road to the truth. They can still be interrogated and revised or cognitively reframed when they're not useful in the moment. But these decisions must be made on a case-by-case -case basis rather than in a blanket way. Speaking of these evolutionary insights helping us to cognitively reframe our emotions, uh, I think this is one of the big uses of this way of thinking, is that it may help us with our second-order emotions. And what I mean by second-order emotions is that we sometimes feel frustrated or angry with ourselves about our emotions. For example, the canonical example here to me would be the hedonic treadmill. The hedonic treadmill is that phenomenon whereby we accomplish something and then we feel pride for a short period and happiness, but then the pride soon dissipates, the happiness melts away, and we quickly revert to our emotional baseline. We go right back to the emotional baseline that we had before we accomplished the good thing. And we sometimes feel frustrated with ourselves about this, thinking, why do I need to be this way? Why can't I just keep feeling pride and happiness at that good thing I accomplished? And I think, of course, the evolutionary insight here is that if we imagine our ancestors, imagine that some of them accomplished something and then rested on their laurels forever, whereas others accomplished something and then they felt pride for a while and happy for a while, but then they soon started craving their next accomplishment. They soon started gunning for their next goal. And then if we ask ourselves, who would have outcompeted whom in the game of survival and reproduction, the answer is obvious. And so what this tells us is the apparent surface level irrationality of the hedonic treadmill is underlain by a deeper adaptive rationality. It's undergirded by a deeper adaptive logic. And why do I think this is interesting or helpful? Because I think that understanding this takes some of the sting out of the hedonic treadmill. It helps us to realize that oh, I'm not so weird for being this way. I'm not so abnormal. My brain operates this way for a reason. Our brain evolved this way for a reason. It's a feature, not a bug. If you were to rerun the simulation hundreds or thousands of times, it would emerge this way many more times because it's not a bug. It's a feature. Your brain evolved that way for a reason. So I think that evolutionary thinking can help us cognitively reframe our emotions in this way, taking some of the sting out of, for example, the hedonic treadmill and taking some of our second order emotions, like feeling angry or frustrated with ourselves about our emotions can help reduce some of that suffering. It's also possible that this kind of evolutionary cognitive reframing may help with our first order emotions. For example, 
anxiety and panic. Anxiety and panic are subject to the smoke detector principle, which Randy Nessie has also done key seminal work on this as well. And the smoke detector principle, which also sometimes is referred to as error management theory, is this idea that when organisms face decision-making problems or inferential problems, there is usually two kinds of errors they can make, a false negative or a false positive. And often, one of these errors is more dangerous or more costly than the other. And if that's the case, organisms will evolve decision-making systems in their brain that are biased, adaptively biased, toward the less costly error. In the case of anxiety and panic, the two kinds of errors would be failing to react to a real threat or reacting to a quote-unquote threat that wasn't really a danger and didn't really merit a response. And between the two of these, failing to react to a real threat is much more dangerous and could potentially be fatal. And that's why our anxiety and panic have evolved to be hyper-responsive or overreactive. I think that understanding this um, helps us to see again that the apparent irrationality of our anxiety and panic and how over-responsive they are is actually underlain by a deep-seated adaptive logic. This is not a faulty mechanism. It is this way by design. It's overreactive by design because the other kind of error would have been so terribly fatal. And this may help to mitigate anxiety spirals to the extent that anxiety feeds anxiety and panic feeds panic, which we know that they do, and we can get caught in these positive feedback loops or vicious feedback cycles, then this may help um, stop or reduce the extent to which our anxiety feeds anxiety or panic feeds panic. For sadness, the evolutionary cognitive insight here might be, maybe there's something in your life that needs to change that ought to be looked at. Uh, maybe there's something about, uh, are you stuck in a dead-end career or in a romantic relationship that's not working or that is um, abusive or hurting you in some other way? And I think our, our natural inclination for many people when we feel sad is to distract from the sadness or run away from it or medicate it. But the evolutionary insight here might be, well, before doing that, it may perhaps be worth sitting with the sadness for a while and seeing what kind of ruminations it throws at you or cognitive insights it may yield about aspects of your life that might need to change. Okay, so um, by the way, these ideas, uh, I'm really interested in, in testing some of them empirically, and uh, I have uh, just begun doing so even with some of the folks in the audience today, Adam and others. We're now working on some ideas that are empirical tests of either these or similar ideas. And if anybody listening ever wants to chat or also wants to test ideas in this space with patient populations or with the general population, I would love to chat. Okay, moving forward, um, I have already mentioned that this part of the talk is a little bit more speculative. And so there's that caveat. There's one other caveat I'd like to add, which is that even if these reframings and these insights are useful and helpful, there are going to be individual differences in how useful they are. There are going to be individual differences in how people respond to them. For example, the most obvious uh, individual difference that's going to matter here is belief in human evolution. If you don't believe that the brain is a product of evolution, then these insights are probably not going to do much for you. Um, less obvious, but perhaps equally important, there are personality traits and individual difference variables that are probably going to mediate how useful these insights are for you. Um, one such personality trait is need for cognition, which describes a person's interest in cognitively challenging puzzles, desire to grapple with difficult and thorny cognitive issues to think through them, or how much a person cares about these sorts of, these sorts of cognitive insights. And so I suspect that uh, personality traits and individual difference variables like need for cognition may affect how useful these insights are or aren't. Somebody higher in that trait might respond better to learning this information. Finally, I think it's possible that these insights may help us improve our relationships with our loved ones. If we remember that emotions are guides to self-interest and that they help people advocate for their own needs and interests, 
then this can help us when we're conflicting with loved ones. When we see that they're mad at us or sad at us, we can we can understand that they're not really trying to hurt us. They're just advocating for themselves. They're advocating for their own needs, which is what their emotions are supposed to do, act as guides to adaptive behavior and, and self-interest. A great example of this, I think, is anger. There's some really good work on anger showing that it is a tool for negotiating welfare trade-off ratios, which means if I think you haven't treated me well enough, if I think you haven't placed enough emphasis on my welfare, I exhibit anger in an attempt to bargain with you, in an attempt to convince you to place more emphasis on my welfare in the future and treat me better in the future. And I don't have a ton of time to talk about anger. I'll just mention for whoever is interested, this uh, much of the work on this has been done by Aaron Sell, S-E-L-L, so you can look up his papers afterward. But the point for our purposes here is that when somebody's angry at you, they're not trying to hurt you. They're actually feeling hurt themselves, feeling that you haven't paid sufficient attention to their welfare, and they're merely trying to negotiate with you to care more about them in the future. And so in this way, I think an evolutionary understanding of emotions might be able to give us a deeper understanding of conflict or a more sympathetic approach to where our interlocutors are coming from or where our conflict partners are coming from. And it may help us to um, treat more gently the classical types of conflict that we get into, sibling conflict, parent-offspring conflict, and friend and romantic conflict. And so ultimately, this might help us become a little bit more tolerant of our loved ones, a little bit gentler in the way that we conflict with people. Okay, uh, so some key takeaways from this talk is I'm basically done. So just sharing the points I would like you to remember. One very fruitful way of thinking about emotions is that they are coordinating mechanisms or modes of operation. This means that they are much more than just feeling states or what it feels like to be in the grip of that emotion. Instead, they coordinate or regulate the activity of more than a dozen different things in cognition, physiology, and behavior, and that these uh, changes form a functionally coherent set that are organized or oriented towards solving an adaptive problem. Emotions are adaptive and serve evolved functions. Uh, even if they may appear irrational, they are often undergirded by a deeper adaptive rationality, um, but they can still go awry. This doesn't mean that they're always good or must always be trusted. In fact, it's unhelpful to have a blanket always trust or, or always uh, regard as irrational and vilify. <laughs> we should remember that ancestrally emotions are on average guides to adaptive action. This doesn't mean that every single instance or manifestation will be adaptive. It doesn't mean off emotions offer a privileged window onto the truth, but it does mean that they evolved for a reason, that they serve a function, and that on average, they're doing a useful job. I suggested that this approach has certain theoretical and empirical advantages over older evolutionary approaches, in particular the basic emotions view. The theoretical advantages are that it avoids or eschews the arbitrary stipulations of that approach, the arbitrary criteria for what delineates a basic from a non-basic emotion. And the empirical advantages are that this approach has yielded dozens of new hypotheses and dozens of new findings about a variety of emotions, such as pride, shame, romantic love, jealousy, disgust, gratitude, guilt, and more. And we had time to talk about only a couple of those today. We didn't have time to talk about the others, but if anybody wants to chat during the Q&A or, or by email, I'd be happy to recommend a couple papers or a couple chapters that provide a summary of those new discoveries. And then finally, a tad more speculatively, I think that understanding the evolutionary basis of our emotions can offer cognitive insights that help us to reframe our emotions in a way that reduces suffering in a way that reduce, takes some of the sting out of things like the hedonic treadmill and um, perhaps takes some of the suffering out of our first and second order emotions and maybe even gives us a more sympathetic or gentler understanding of um, conflict with our loved ones. More broadly, I would say that emotions are central to how the mind works. Sometimes in psychology, they're, they're thought of as a non-mainstream or even fringe topic, but they are anything but. They permeate and pervade everything we do. 
and they are involved in almost everything in psychology and behavior. I would say that evolutionary principles help us understand the mind, both when it is working as expected and when it is not. And uh, I'd like to offer this quote ending or nearly ending uh, the talk with this quote by famous evolutionary biologist George Williams, who said, is it not reasonable to anticipate that our understanding of the human mind would be aided greatly by knowing the purpose for which it was designed? And of course, he means designed without a designer, i.e. crafted by natural selection. And I think this is true of the mind in general, and it's also true of emotions in specific. And so I'd like to end by um, asking you to forgive a shameless plug for a book that we have coming out in early 2024 that I think might be of interest to people in this audience. It's called The Oxford Handbook of Evolution and the Emotions, and it contains about 70 chapters about a variety of different emotions, how to understand and study them from an evolutionary perspective, how they relate to other domains of life like politics, morality, friendship, forgiveness, the legal system, and more, and how they are implicated in psychopathology, for example, in um, personality disorders, depression, eating disorders, and more. And so that'll be coming out in early 2024, and I hope it might be of interest to this audience. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for your time and attention. I'm around for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Leith, for that uh, really compelling talk. I can see why you won awards for your teaching. It was really, um, yeah, excellent. I have several questions to ask you, actually, Leith. Um, okay. Some points. <laughs> uh, and also, maybe if, if anyone else in the chat wants to uh, chip in, just uh, raise your voice. Oh, hey, Randy. Do you want to? Hi, um... Hi, Hi Randy. Uh, Randy, would you like to start? Do you have a comment or a question? Yeah, if that's okay, that'd be good because I got to take off and give a talk over here in my my community in just a few minutes. Um, I mean, first of all, Leith, you're so wonderfully articulate, and it's I wish every psychiatrist could hear your talk, not just psychiatrists, but any mental health clinician. Um, and I hope this recording will reach hundreds of people instead of the small group that are here. I think it'll be well worth it um, if Adam can get it posted in the way. I bet people will because it's a whole world psychiatric association that should have access to this. Um, the other things I really love, I mean. I think I've been out of touch. Your empathy is better than mine for what people need to hear. Because the whole business is about the, you know, people assume it's feeling, you know? And I say that, but I think I don't really get it. I mean, that's so central. And I'm going to try to adjust my talks uh, to try to, to say that more. Um, in terms of disagreements, I don't think there's much we disagree about, except for the very large framing of things. And we can have a fun conversation about that sometime. Um, I have a companion here. Lily, take a look. Lily, say hi to Leif. Yeah, Finally, hi Lily. So um, this is a this is a trick actually. Um, but do you do you experience any emotion looking at this darling thing? I mean, if you don't, there's something wrong. I mean, it's some kind of cute like uh, love smile. Everybody smiles. Margaret and yeah. I feel that maybe maybe our purpose in life right now is to go around uh, bringing smiles to people by taking her places. And the question is, so what problem does that emotion solve? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know that some people have worked on exactly that, and I believe they call it kamamuta, which they think of as the cuteness or compassion emotion that is elicited when looking at, at babies or at uh, puppies or other cute Japanese, animals. Japanese anime and then dolls with giant eyes. and, and yeah. yeah, yeah, trying to elicit those feelings on purpose. Um, I'm not sure if I have strong views on that, but I think what they would say is that it is it solves the problem of helping you bond with the uh, young needy infant that needs your help and that is altricial, and so motivates caretaking. And then whether it is a byproduct when applied to other animals or not, I'm not sure what they would say, but I, I think that's probably how they'd approach that. So I'll just emphasize again, Leith, that you know the, the focus of your talk on the adaptive value of emotions could really transform the way people look at mental disorders and especially emotional disorders. Only those things could get across. And I'm not sure it makes much difference uh, whether my take on situations or the other take on coordinating systems um, is, is the way it's all framed. But I would like to talk with you about that sometime. 
because I, I mean, I think it's the ontological status of those problems that is mm-hmm. at issue. I mean, it, where do they exist? And and I think you know, they are indeed the impetus for natural selection working, whether it's an opportunity or a threat. Um, but it seems to me that natural selection isn't that smart. I mean, it doesn't know about problems in my view. It only knows about these set of cues all happen together. And when they all happen together, um, it's good to reset the system to this way. And that helps to explain also why emotions are pretty crude. You know, it, it's why people who have a fight with the boss come home and kick the dog. Terrible people who kick the dog. Um, yeah. So it, it helps us understand that you know, they're not really designed systems that solve problems readily um, and specifically. Again, but this is for a longer discussion that you and I can have another time. I want to make sure other people can ask questions that I'd like to hear their questions before I have to leave. Sure. I'll just say in response to that, that I think once we start to hammer this out, we'll figure out whether it's a disagreement of substance or a disagreement of wording, because a collection of cues in a situation can be regarded as a problem without necessarily committing oneself to the ontological status of that problem existing in some ether space. Um, So maybe we're just using different terms for the same thing, or maybe it's more than that. But I think that part of what we're doing is um, carving things up conceptually in a way that is useful for us epistemologically as humans when we generate hypotheses and answer questions, and maybe calling it a situation full of cues or call, calling it a problem is whatever we regard as mo- more useful for trigger for generating new hypotheses or or opening new lines of inquiry as opposed to making a definite ontological claim. But I think that probably is a, a discussion. It, it's also interesting, isn't it? I mean, the fact that so many smart people have worked on this for so long and it's not all crystal clear to all of us is, is, is itself an interesting uh, fact. That's true, yeah. So yeah, just to chip in on maybe the, the last point that Randy was making about these like re- emotions being very crude, I wonder if um, the points you made at the end, Leith, about the emotions being successful on average could kind of capture a lot of that, like the you know anger at being kind of abused by your boss um, causes this emotion of anger to yeah to persist, and then you know then all sorts of weird things happen, like you go and kick the dog, even though it's not doing anything to rectify the situation. And maybe the, maybe maybe emotions are just really crude, or perhaps there's also weird stuff about modern environments that means that you know you you can go home and leave your boss, and your anger will just be taken out on something um, something else. Um, but yeah, I had a yeah, I have, I have various um, questions. Uh, maybe first a comment also to align with with what Randy said about um, this emphasis on the behavioral and physiological differences, as well as the the kind of the sensed cognition. Um, I think that's super important. Uh, yeah, it really seems like probably critical. And I I was thinking of um, the depression example. Of, you know, depression has all these very like physical symptoms, the tiredness, changes in appetite, changes in sleeping. Um, and I, I think it's kind of quite plausible that a lot of um, clinical psychology has been thinking so much about the, the, the felt cognitive process, but has been ignoring these behavioral aspects, um, which might actually be more important to kind of explain why low mood, which maybe then can kind of persist and become depression, um, is important. So, so yeah, I think that's a that's a really important um, contribution of, of this kind of looking at through this kind of sweet um, method. Um, that's more of a comment than a question. But then, I, but but I did have a question uh, regarding um, like the the correct duration of emotions. So, obviously, emotions. You you were specifically talking about kind of being people people being in the grip of emotions, and and to me that seems like those times when you know you really are overtaken by an emotion. And you spend, you know, minutes or hours kind of in it. Um, but then are there times when you don't feel emotions? I mean, personally, you know, on, on a day-to-day basis, I feel like I'm not really in the grip of emotions too much. And like they occur sometimes when a, when something happens. And that seems to fit this strategy idea that like the emotion reacts to something in the environment. Uh, and then, and then so the, the kind of question is like, yeah, can you think of disordered emotions, especially emotions that persist too long and outside of the context when they're meant to be? So I'm thinking of like, you know, 
social anxiety or or you know when you, and or like especially anxiety where you can kind of you can feel very anxious about something that's not an immediate threat but you're kind of worried about going into this meeting later um and actually what happens is we sort of imagine ourselves into that situation and then the emotion persists for hours and hours without it actually reacting to anything useful uh, and yeah, I wonder if like, uh, yeah, if possibly one simple way that emotions can become disordered is just by, you know, acting for too long or outside of the context. Um, and if you've kind of thought about that or yeah, what, what you would say to that, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very reasonable. I think that um, one one way that emotions can be disordered is by engaging in too volatile swings in being tripped too easily, in staying active for too long. So these things of duration, threshold, magnitude can all be ways that that, that they react um, or that they can be disordered. Um, Randy's done some really interesting work on mood. And when you talk about emotions that persist for quite a while, maybe emotions that persist under the radar at a low level for quite a, quite a while, that makes me think of mood, which if I'm not mistaken, Randy has written about as being, for example, low mood signals to you that circumstances are unpropitious for this undertaking and that perhaps a recalibration is needed. Um, what you know? What is the boundary between emotion and mood? I think most psychologists tend to think of it as a, a duration thing, although I don't know if there's a sharp boundary. Um, to address a couple of the other things that you said, <clears throat> Emotions as crude, I mean, they're crude in the sense that they can make mistakes, they can misfire. As you noted, it can be on average useful, but have instances or in, or manifestations that are unhelpful. But I don't know if they're noticeably or substantially cruder than memory or problem solving or reasoning or um, other aspects of human cognition. Those other aspects are also capable of spectacularly useful things and capable of numerous errors. And I think in order to explain how they are both adaptive and can go wrong, we would probably use things like mismatch. We would use on average versus every instance. We would use these other heuristics to explain that. And so that's definitely true of emotions. I don't know if it's more true of emotions or that they're cruder compared to these other aspects of psychology, like memory and reasoning and so on and so forth. And then there was one other interesting thing that you that you mentioned. It was the middle point about the overemphasis on the felt experience. I think that is generally a problem in psychology. If you look at areas like social psychology, it is basically thought that emotions that feel good are good, emotions that feel bad are bad. And that a good goal, a reasonable goal is to reduce feeling bad as if that really solves the problem. Um, and there's very little sort of awareness that that there might be an objective external problem that needs solving and that the internal state may be indicative of that problem. And so the goal isn't to reduce pain, it's to reduce the tissue damage that the pain is signaling. And so there is this strange um, overemphasis in psychology and I think in the general public on how the emotion feels. And uh, yeah, so just agreeing with you that that incorporating the physiology, the behavior, and the other cognitive changes too, like the memory and attention and perception, are important so that we have a more comprehensive understanding of emotion rather than reducing it to just the felt experience. Okay, so so yeah, on on this point of good emotions, I thought about this because uh, I've been doing some research into behavioral addictions recently, and it seems like a lot of addictions to social media is the kind of one that everyone talks about in the, in the mainstream media, but also, you know, like video games. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which, <clears throat> you know, good emotions can kind of become overactivated and you kind of get on this hedonic treadmill. Uh, and very clearly what's happening here is, you know, there's some kind of mismatch, like the your, your good emotion is being activated constantly by something that's been designed specifically to activate that emotion. But obviously what, what it's doing, that, that emotion which you feel when you gain a virtual skill point in a game is very, it's probably the same emotion that you'd probably feel if you gained a skill in real life, but you're not actually gaining a useful skill. Um, and I think it's a massively uh, probably underestimated um, problem in, in mental health, just like how, how bad it is that good emotions are so readily available. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if there's something there in terms of 
like practical insight that evolutionary um psychiatry and psychology can give just in being very wary when you're feeling good about things that aren't actually good for your life uh, in the same yeah. way that feeling bad about things when is useful when there's something that you need to change but it's it's not useful when there's nothing to, you need to change um yeah so yeah how how much of a problem do you think good feelings are <laughs> I, honestly, I think what you said right now is a very useful insight. Um, I agree that having your positive emotions triggered without things actually contributing to your life overall is is not helpful. The, the classical example would be drugs, right? Induce right. euphoria, but nothing good has happened to your life and maybe even something bad is happening to you physiolo physiologically. And so there's drugs, you mentioned video games uh, and social media, I think that's right as well. Another example might be um, those relationships that people have that they think that they have with celebrities who don't even know they exist. Are they called parasocial relationships or something like that? The the notion that you might be obsessed with some celebrity who doesn't even know you exist and you care so much about what their new baby is called and what their new girlfriend or boyfriend is called. And you think of yourself as being in this kind of relationship with this person who doesn't know you exist. Those feelings of and then but then the person posts on Instagram or whatever and you feel like they're talking to you so you feel affection and reward and so on that might be another example of a very unhelpful unhealthy way in which your positive emotions surrounding affiliation and affection and so on are being triggered in a way that's not contributing to your life whatsoever mm -hmm. there might be a small wrinkle and that wrinkle um and this is maybe more of like intellectual interest than a, a big deal that would matter greatly for people. But I can see a world in which if you gain a skill point in a video game and it helps you become better at that video game, if you run in social circles where you get status benefits from being good at the game, then you might actually be gleaning friendships or mateships or other resources from this, this uh, status increase. And so depending on what kind of cir circles you run in, um, that might be an interesting wrinkle. I see Patrick has his hand up and he studies status, so maybe he wants to weigh in. Hey, uh, I guess I wasn't actually trying to weigh in on status, but I'm interested in like this individual differences in, in emotions and how they might kind of um, like blossom out into other broader individual difference constructs like personality and i guess i'm starting to think about that and its relevance for things like personality disorders and other kind of maybe mental illnesses and stuff um and like so it seems like a lot of the focus is just on like the manifestations of emotions so far but one thing that i guess you didn't talk about in this talk today but i think to and cosmides talk about this is uh, like the need for situation detectors within the emotion system so there has to be some kind of mechanism within the broader emotion system that figures out what cues are relevant for what adaptive problems is the way I kind of interpret that. So in order to um, you know, solve the problem of uh, devaluation, like for shame, you have to de detect de devaluation. And there could be individual differences right in the things that people detect as devaluation and those would lead to differences in manifestations of shame like hiding away or lying or whatever um, but it's not like the shame manifestations themselves might be functioning correctly so i think kind of appreciating all of the different ways that individual differences can creep into this um, two emotion systems could yeah. be useful maybe from a clinical perspective to try and pinpoint like maybe, you know, where things are going wrong, so to speak, if we're going to say that the emotion system is designed to be, to work in this particular way, then deviations from that design um, are useful for understanding why people are different from one another. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And one way that we might think of it is like individual differences in different stages of the process of detecting the situation or detecting the problem. There can be individual differences in the parameters of the mechanisms. There can be individual differences in, like we were saying before, thresholds or duration of activation. 
And what might be cool is to to map out maybe something that we can talk about more later, um, sequentially and in parallel, the different stages of the system and the different places that you can have individual differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like maybe that could be useful from like a clinical perspective to try and like pinpoint where is something going wrong. Yeah, yeah. I think it could be useful, uh, as you say, clinically, and it could also be um, a really good first step at get, gaining a greater understanding of the individual differences involved in emotions, the different steps and the different stages. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. One of the cool things maybe that is suggested by an evolutionary perspective about, say, shame, is that you kind of, you suggest that, okay, the problem is that the person thinks that they are massively devalued. Um, mm -hmm. The obvious solution is show people that they're not massively devalued, right? Which which might be quite different to people who have, or to, to current CBT, which might be just kind of teaching you to just try and not think about the shame, but maybe there's something kind of very social uh, that you could do, like, you know, um, call a load of friends around to say why the why they value the person. Um, you know, there's like this very direct way. So, similarly with anger, if you have like pathological anger, maybe the, maybe people just need to realize that they're not being, um, yeah, de devalued and having to kind of get angry to try and rectify that. Uh, yeah, I think that's quite a nice uh, the, that adds like a, a sort of different lens to to like a therapeutic approach, especially from like a clinical psych um, perspective. It does, and it gets at that idea that you don't always just want to change the psychology or the processing. Sometimes you want to solve the external problem. And yeah. so I think that's a great idea. And and it's actually cool that an evolutionary perspective <clears throat> offers remedies for both, for the external problem, like how you just mentioned with shame and devaluation, and for the reframing and reprocessing cognitively, because I think it offers insights to both. You're probably better off tackling both than tackling only one. Sorry, Patrick, I think you were going to say something. Oh, yeah, I was just going to kind of pick up on, on Adam's point. Yeah, it's almost like two different interventions from a clinical perspective. You could have, let's say you have two people, one person, they correctly perceive um, undervaluation in the case of anger, but their difference from other people is that they ramp up their anger incredibly quickly for like one unit of undervaluation. So that's one case. And then you have another person who uh, they don't ra ramp up their anger very quickly in response to undervaluation, but they do tend to perceive undervaluation where there isn't undervaluation. And it, you know, those are two very different, I would imagine, interventions that you would want to do as a clinician for, for the case of, not per or of misperceiving undervaluation. You want to recalibrate their system that perceives undervaluation. Whereas for the person who is just ramping up their anger maybe too too quickly or something from a social perspective, uh, you'd want to somehow recalibrate their system that links inputs of anger to outputs of anger. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. yeah. Yeah. Like anger management strategies on the one side for the person who goes really high and then just kind of rethinking or like you know but yeah some kind of cbt where they where the person kind of does inner work to realize that they're kind of over um overthinking uh people's devaluation of them on the other yeah yeah that's 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 quite specific and nice we just need some people to actually test this yeah um, yeah i just never even thought about clinical approaches to stuff before so it's kind of cool to think about why that might actually be useful actually there's a good book called um the new CBT by Mike Abrams. Mike Abrams, who's a clinical psychologist. Actually, he doesn't he doesn't go this into this much detail, and he doesn't think about the the kind of especially emotions um, that much. He mainly talks about it destigmatizing therapy, and also encourages um, clinicians to kind of look for positive sides. Like he he too talks about you know uh, treating a psychopath is going to be very hard. Um, but you can try and work within the sort of psychopathic sort of selfish strategy to try and um, utilize it rather than rather than kind of suppress it, just accept that, okay, this person has this more selfish strategy, but you have to kind of convince them to be selfish by actually not being, you know, abusive to other people, but, you know, helping them or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so, I mean, we're kind of nearing the end of the, the question time. I had... Um, I have various other questions, but I, 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 it's fine. I think we'll uh, 
I think we we've we've covered a lot of really good ground here. Um, Lathe, any any kind of if you've got if you've got more, and if nobody else um, does, I'm I'm okay on time. If you are, uh, well, I, I mean, just one small thing that like I did wonder your kind of criticism of the basic emotions um, and these kind of like these specific seven or six, um, and then using an evolutionary framing to kind of uh, do a better job of understanding the emotions. Is there a should we be trying to look for a specific number of evolved emotions? I mean, I know evolutionary psychologists have looked at these specific emotions like shame and anger and whatever, but um, uh, is the goal to kind of create the real number? Like it's not seven, it's 12 or something. Or it, do, do we think an evolutionary approach kind of should push us away from that, um, even though it is like psychologically appealing? You know, I think that a lot of this has to do with how you carve uh, up the mechanisms of the mind or the modules of the mind or the emotions. If you want to be a lumper versus a splitter, if you want to make very fine grain differentiations, or if you want to um, sort of glide over those. And so I think it's possible to, to have larger numbers or smaller numbers, depending on your purposes and what kind of question you're trying to answer. To me, um, it it is helpful to think of jealousy as distinct from envy, as distinct from guilt, as distinct from disgust, and thinking that the the reason they're distinct is that they each evolved to solve a very different adaptive problem. Now, whether then you want to say like, well, so is friendship jealousy the same as uh, mateship jealousy, and you get into that kind of question, I'm not sure there is. I'm not sure that's the most helpful question. I think that um, it's not like we're trying to go for the holy grail of a specific number, but whether the kinds of differentiations that we draw should be driven by the questions that we're trying to answer and should make those questions tractable or answerable by helping us with generating hypotheses or designing studies. So I don't, um, I think that we can get too involved in splitting hairs, but yeah, Patrick said, feels like how many angels fit on the head of a pin type situation. Yeah, I think we can spin our wheels and get involved in splitting hairs. But I don't think that means that it is a made up distinction to say hunger solves a different problem than anger and anger solves a different problem than disgust. I think that is true. Yeah, I'm wondering in a clinical setting, if um, if someone presents and to comes to, comes to the clinic, and they say, I have like very specific jealousy around the workplace. It's like, you don't really want to have a whole evolutionary theory for w what exactly is going on there um, in terms of like, you know, cooperating people. And maybe it's because the, there's like sexual dynamics or something. But maybe what, what we want is for clinical psychologists to have like a good background in sort of basic anthropological information to know what, you know, human society looks like. Um, to then tailor the, and also some, you know, some, a decent background in evolutionary psychology, and then they can kind of tailor their explanation to, to the individual, which, which is what happens at the moment with CBT, you know, a good therapist will kind of listen to the person's exact problems and try and work out like the exact kind of, um, cognitive changes and, and behavioral changes to make. Um, so yeah, maybe, yeah, I, I think probably you don't need to say that this, whatever, eight, eight specific emotions, but probably just giving some kind of background like this to clinical psychologists could actually just make them much more effective and be able to tell their patient, you know, to give these stories, um, which the, which will really help the person kind of understand why they're feeling like this and probably maybe hopefully suggest a way out of it. Um, I think that's, that's, that's a pretty good avenue to go. Yeah. And maybe, you know, the, the general rules of thumb or heuristics, like ancestrally versus currently, on average versus every manifestation, some very simple heuristics can yield a lot of value. Like the idea is simple and can be appreciated quite quickly or why something would evolve to be over-responsive like panic or anxiety, how that could be a feature, not a bug or the hedonic treadmill. They're simple ideas, but they immediately yield new insights. And I think that, you know, what are, what are, the, the various, if we were to create a kind of guidebook for what are useful principles for clinicians or practitioners to incorporate, there are some very simple ones um, that would go a long way, I think, from an evolutionary perspective. Sounds like we need to write that guidebook. Um, <laughs> it's a project for the for the future. Uh, okay, so we've hit the, the half an hour. Uh, 
thank you so much, Leith. It was a really fascinating, firstly, thank presentation you. and also an excellent um, Q&A. And I, I really enjoyed it. It's going to make a really great addition to the, the YouTube. And I look forward to kind of following up with your work and working with you on stuff in, in the future. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending. And yes, I'll, uh, I'll see you around. Thanks a lot for having me. Pleasure. Take care, everybody. Cheers.